Hi, it's Miss Vital. This is the second podcast for my AP Biology class, the unit on regulating the internal environment. We're going to pick up talking about amphibians and reptiles. Most of them are ectotherms. They have low metabolic rates that don't influence their body temperature. The optimal body temperature for amphibians varies. When exposed to air, amphibians lose heat fast due to moist skin evaporation. They use behavior to regulate temperature, like moving to warmer or cooler areas. Bullfrogs can control mucus secretions that helps regulate evaporative cooling. Reptiles control their body temperature mainly by behavior. In warm areas, they spread their body out. In cool areas, they curl up. The marine iguana from the Galapagos Islands uses vasoconstriction of superficial blood vessels to root more blood to their core because they dive down into cold water to eat the algae off of the rocks at the bottom. A few large reptiles become endothermic under special conditions. For example, female pythons incubating eggs increase their body temperature by shivering. Researchers continue to debate if some dinosaurs were endothermic. When we talk about fishes, most fishes are conformers. They are usually within one to two degrees of surrounding water temperature. Swimming muscles may be large and active, but most metabolic heat that is generated is lost to the environment when blood passes through the gills. There are some specialized endothermic fish. Large fish like tuna, swordfish, great white sharks have circulatory adaptations that retain metabolic heat in the body. Large arteries move cold blood from the gills to the tissues under the skin. Branches deliver blood to the deep muscles where small vessels are arranged into a countercurrent heat exchange. This keeps the main swimming muscles several degrees warmer than the tissues near the surface. In invertebrates, aquatic invertebrates are conformers with little control over their body temperature. Many terrestrial invertebrate, invertebrates adjust their temperature through behavior. Many flying insects are endothermic. Their powerful flight muscles generate a lot of heat. They can also shiver flight muscles to warm up before taking off. They also have a countercurrent heat exchange in their thorax where their flight muscles are. This can be shut down in hot weather so heat is lost to prevent overheating. Honeybees huddle to keep warm and move in and out of the huddle to distribute the heat. This uses a lot of energy so they store food, their honey, in their hives. They also cool their hives by bringing in water and fan it with their wings to create evaporative cooling. Now let's look at feedback mechanisms in thermoregulation. In mammals, nerve cells control thermoregulation. The nerve cells are concentrated in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus contains groups of nerves that function as the thermostat. Nerve cells that sense temperature are in the skin, the hypothalamus, and in other body parts. If heat goes below the normal range, the thermostat inhibits heat loss mechanisms and activates heat saving ones. If heat goes up, the thermostat shuts down heat retention mechanisms and promotes cooling using things like vasodilation, panting, sweating. When we talk about adjustment to changing temperatures, acclimatization is when an animal adjusts to a new range of environmental temperatures over a period of days or weeks. Both ecto and endotherms acclimatize, but in different ways. For example, some animals grow winter coats, then they shed them. That helps them to maintain their body temperature in cooler, I'm sorry, in warmer weather. In ectotherms, they compensate for changes in temperature, like the catfish in the summer can survive weather temperatures of 36 degrees Celsius, but can't function in cold water. They acclimate again in summer, but die in water over 28 degrees Celsius. This is accomplished by high enzyme levels to compensate for very low enzyme activity. Some ectotherms produce antifreeze that prevents cells from freezing. Cryoprotectants are antifreeze that occur naturally in cells.
Stress-induced proteins are produced by cells when stressed. They include heat shock proteins produced when cells are shocked from rapid changes in temperature. They help to maintain other proteins that would be denatured. Stress-induced proteins help prevent cell death when an organism is challenged by severe changes, like toxins, a change in pH, or a viral infection. Topor is a physiological state in which activity is low and metabolism decreases. It is used when animals are severely challenged to maintain homeostasis. Hibernation is a long-term topor that evolved as an adaptation to winter cold and food scarcity. During hibernation, birds and mammals have a declining body temperature. Their thermostat is turned down. It can go as low as one to two degrees Celsius, which is supercooled but unfrozen. Metabolism can be several hundred times lower than normal. They can survive on energy stored in body or food stored in the burrow. Estivation is a summer topor. Animals can survive high temperatures and low amounts of water when estivating. Also, like hibernation, metabolism slows and there is a very low level of activity. Land snails, land crabs, crocodiles are examples of animals that estivate, but no mammals do. Daily topor is when um, we see in small birds and mammals. This is basically adapted to feeding patterns. Bats and shrews feed at night and are inactive during the day. Let's talk about water balance and waste disposal. Osmin regulation is the management of the body's water, its contents, and its solutes. Animals need to regulate chemical composition of their body fluids. Osmoregulation is the ultimate function that maintains the composition of the cytoplasm in the body's cells. Most animals do this indirectly by managing the composition of internal body fluid that bathes cells. Transport epithelium is a layer of specialized epithelium. It regulates solute movement. It is essential for balancing water and removing waste. It can move specific solutes in controlled amounts in certain directions. Transport epithelium is arranged into complex tubular networks in most animals. For example, who obtain food and water from the sea. Transport epithelium disposes of metabolic waste. Most metabolic waste must be dissolved in water to be removed from the body, except for CO2. That is lost in air breathing. Nitrogenous waste affects osmoregulation the most. Nitrogenous waste comes from the breakdown of proteins and nucleic acids. The proteins are enzymes that break them down and move nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Ammonia is a small and very toxic molecule. Some animals secrete ammonia directly this conserves energy. Other animals convert ammonia into urea or uric acid, which is less toxic. Ammonia is very sol soluble. It can only be tolerated at very low concentrations, and we find this commonly in aquatic species. Ammonia molecules pass through membranes and diffuse into surrounding water. In invertebrates, ammonia is lost over the whole body surface. In fish, it is lost through the gills. Urea is produced in the vertebrate liver by a metabolic process that combines ammonia with CO2. The circulatory system carries urea to the kidneys. Urea is 100,000 times less toxic than ammonia. It can be stored in higher concentrations and less water is needed for excretion. However, a disadvantage is that it uses a lot of energy to produce urea. Uric acid is secreted by land snails, insects, birds, and many reptiles. Uric acid is relatively non-toxic, but it's insoluble in water, whereas ammonia and urea are soluble. So it's excreted as a semi-solid paste with small water loss. It is more energy expensive than producing urea. One important factor in what types of animals evolved urea or uric acid. Urea is the soluble waste diffuses out of shellless amphibian eggs 
and can be carried in the mother's blood of mammals. With uric acid, eggshells are permeable to gases, not liquids. Therefore, solid waste could accumulate in eggs and be toxic. Uric acid precipitates out of solution and can be stored in the egg as a harmless solid. Also, the evolution of uric acid or urea nitrogenous waste depended on if the animals lived in water or not. For example, terrestrial turtles excrete uric acid. Aquatic turtles excrete urea and ammonia. In all animals, the uptake and loss of water in cells must balance to prevent the cells from shriveling or bursting. Water enters and leaves cells by osmosis. Osmolarity is the solute concentration expressed as molarity. It's expressed in moles of solute per liter of solution. The units of osmolarity used is milliosmoles per liter, or MOSM slash capital L. The osmolarity of human blood is about 300 milliosmoles per liter. The osmolarity of seawater is about 1,000 milliosmoles per liter. Isoosmotic is as if the two solutions separated by a selectively permeable membrane have the same osmolarity. There is no net movement of water. When there's two different osmolarity solutions, the one with the greater concentration is hyperosmotic, and the one with the lower concentration is hypoosmotic. Water flows from hypoosmotic to hyperosmotic. Marine animals are isoosmotic to their surroundings. An osmoconformer is an animal which does not actively adjust to its internal osmolarity. There is no tendency to gain or lose water because they are isoosmotic. They usually live in water with stable compositions. Osmoregular regulators are animals that must control its internal osmolarity. Its body fluids are not isoosmotic with the environment. They must release water in a hypoosmotic environment and take in water in a hyperosmotic environment. This uses energy. A stenohaline is an animal that can't tolerate substantial changes in external osmolarity. A urohaline can survive large changes of external osmolarity, for example, the salmon. Animals first evolved in the sea and more animal phyla are found in marine environments than anywhere else. Most marine invertebrates are osmoconformers. Marine vertebrates are osmoregulators. The ocean is saltier, a higher concentration than their bodies. They constantly lose water through their gills and skin. They get water in food and drinking. The salt intake is diffused out of the gills through active transport and very little urine is produced. Freshwater fish are the opposite of marine fish. They constantly gain water and they excrete large amounts of dilute urine. Anhydrobiosis is when an animal, like aquatic invertebrates, lose almost all their body water and live in a dehydrated state. They may live in a muddy environment with high concentration and add water as they hydrate. Most terrestrial animals have coverings that prevent dehydration. Humans die if they lose 12% of their body water. Desert animals are nocturnal to prevent water loss. Land animals need to drink a lot. They use metabolic water also.